Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. I'm super excited for this video. I'm back at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and I'm with the gardens manager, Doug Roran, who is incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I'm excited to have him on, on the channel today. And we're gonna be covering some flowering trees. Uh, can you tell us a little something about your time and experience here at the Ralston and something about yourself? Sure, as gardens manager, I've been in the job about four and a half years. Um, my ex time with the Arboretum goes back many decades. I started as a volunteer about 1985. Wow. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here with Jim this morning because it's the last day of February and it's a really good time to see some uh, early blooming trees. Yeah, 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 and me too. And I have not, my channel is definitely lacking on trees. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be with someone who's knowledgeable about it. Uh, so we're going to start with a few magnolias. The magnolia collection, if you, if you get the opportunity to come to Raleigh, if you're not from Raleigh, uh, at J.C. Ralston Arboretum in late February, early March, the deciduous magnolias are in full bloom. And it's just amazing. Some fragrant, some not. And Doug's going to tell us about some of them. Um, the one behind us is called Scented Silver. It's one of my favorites every year. Can you tell us something about stellatas? Yeah, magnolia stellata is a... Uh, Japanese species. It's typically white. We will probably see a beautiful pink selection this morning. Um, not very well known for their fragrance, but this one uh, called um, Scented Silver is quite fragrant. Even on this chilly morning when it's not quite yet 40 degrees, one can detect a, a bit of fragrance. And when the weather, when the temperatures warm up, you'll smell it on the air. The flowers are a little bit rumpled after yesterday's rain, um, but they're um, you know quite showy for several weeks this time of year. I enjoy the deciduous magnolias in the winter. Their stems are rather uh, pale silvery gray and they're very pretty, especially yeah. if they have a dark evergreen uh, backdrop. Right, and some of them um, end up multi-trunked and some of them uh, end up, I mean, they're trees. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you'd only describe them yeah. as trees and see, people put them in their small urban lots. And yeah. you know, this is, this is one of the smaller versions yeah. of, of what we're going to see. Yeah. There's, uh, we'll also see a number of selections of uh, the saucer magnolia, Magnolia solangiana, mm -hmm. and it tends to be larger growing than um, the star magnolia. Um, they are definitely trees. I, I define trees as plants with permanent trunks. Right. Um, you know, right. shrubs, a lot of shrubs tend to have stems that are replaced, old stems are replaced by new stems, but these have, you know, the same trunks for their entire life. Um, star magnolias, you know, 20 feet tall or so, saucer magnolias, maybe 30 or so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there is quite a bit of breeding work going on to breed um, smaller magnolias. Some of the newest ones you're not going to find in a garden center, but certainly could be found in you know, a good right. mail order nursery. This is a uh, selection of saucer magnolia, magnolia ex solangiana. Um, you can see why they're called saucer magnolias. I grew up calling them uh, tulip trees because the flowers do look quite a bit uh, tulip shaped. Um, Magnolia solangiana is named after the person who bred them. They're hybrids between Magnolia lilliflora, which gives it this purple color, and um, Magnolia denudata, which is typically white the, and is known as the Yulon Magnolia from China. Um, they, in time, are pretty good sized trees. Um, you know, maybe up to about 30 feet tall. And we have quite a few different cultivars of them. There's another one over here that's just starting, Sundew, and a, quite a dark one back there that um, we'll see in a minute called Picture. This is Pitcher, the one you uh, just mentioned on the other side. This is actually one of my absolute favorite trees in the entire, in the entire space. And I think I have photos going back years on this thing. It starts with that really dark, dark bud and then as it opens, you know, you see that white on the interior of it that makes it such, it's, it's, it's so contrasty. Uh, just really, really amazing. The one thing about it though, is I'm pulling a branch down to look at it, is that five years ago when I was taking photos, the flowers were here. And now there's none 
Uh, you know, this tree is, how, how tall do you think this is, Doug? 30 feet or so yeah, now? It's, it's 30 feet, I would say. Yeah, yeah. and it's an yeah. incredible statement piece, I mean, like many, many of these out here are. Uh, the early morning sun is really highlighting this very tall magnolia. This is Magnolia ex cuensis, Wada's memory. Wada was a famous Japanese plant breeder. And um, I believe cuensis is a hybrid between Stellata and Magnolia um, denucobis. Um, and nowadays taxonomists have decided that those two species are the same species, just a, one a subspecies of the other, so um, it wouldn't be a hybrid any longer. Um, but it's a large growing one that looks much like a large flowered um, stellata. As I mentioned, the star magnolia, magnolia stellata, is typically white, but this is a real pretty pink selection of it. It has a really long cultivar name, Chrysanthema flora, which just means flower like a chrysanthemum and um, you know again the flowers are a little bit rumpled from last yesterday's rain but they're usually very orderly uh, arrangement of petals um, like a florist chrysanthemum but a nice alternative to the uh, white flowered star magnolias. This is Magnolia denudata, um, the Yulon uh, magnolia from China. And in the wild, I think it's always white. This is a pink selection called forest pink. And it's one of the two parents of the saucer magnolias. And you see that's where they get the lovely um, sort of tulip-shaped flowers. Um, it's an, another large growing uh, deciduous magnolia with a, a bit of fragrance as well. There are a lot of... Um, late winter, early spring flowering cherries. W one cherry that's very common in uh, public plantings in this area is one called Okame. This is a very similar hybrid. Um, it's sort of a remake of Okame, and this one has the uh, cultivar name of First Lady. But they're small trees, um, you know, several weeks of brightly colored flowers, um, and then fairly quiet the rest of the year. Uh, witch hazels are another group of uh, large shrubs to possibly could be trained as small trees uh, that are winter blooming. Um, some of them are already done blooming, they're earlier blooming ones. This is uh, a cultivar named Yelena. A lot of people pronounce it Jelena, but Mrs. de Belder from the Calm Toot Arboretum in Belgium pronounced her name Yelena, that J was, is pronounced like a Y. And this is a very widely available cultivar and a very good performer in the garden with these sort of rusty orange flowers. And you can really see this morning how the color really sparkles when it's backlit by sun. We've come to a spot so that we can see one of the evergreen early flowering magnolias way off in the distance. Hopefully you guys will be able to, you'll be able to see that. Can you yeah. talk about this group yeah, there, there are a group of evergreen magnolias from China that used to be in the genus Michelia, but taxonomists have decided they're closely enough related to the other magnolias, so they're now all in the genus Magnolia. Mm -hmm. And that's Magnolia maudier. It will bloom for months this time of year. If we, if we get a hard freeze, the open flowers will be destroyed, but... Mm -hmm. um, give it a week of mild weather and it'll be back into, in bloom and just bloom for, you know, it'll bloom most of February and most of March. Right, um, and it, how tall, are we, we're, the reason we're standing so far back from it, it must be 35, 30 feet tall. Oh, it, it might be approaching 30 feet. The, uh -huh. the problem is we could walk right up to the tree, but we're under the tree and we don't see the flowers it's only from a distance that we see the flowers right there are several other um, related magnolias there's one over there that has a fair amount of bloom that we could get up close to but this is our best specimen right and that one's been used as a parent for some of the 
other hybrids that are, yes. Yes. yeah, so the Eternal Spring over there, which we're right. kind of in between on flowers. So we've come to another uh, flowering cherry that we're a little early on, but you, um, I wanted you to cover this one just because it has, this one will be a great tree in a small space garden. Yeah, yeah, I'm disappointed that it's not yet in bloom for, for today's presentation, but it does have this nice uh, columnar habit. It's one of those modern introductions where it has a cult of our name and a trademark name. <laughs> right. The trademark name is First Blush, uh -huh. and it's a typical uh, light pink cherry blossom on a nice upright growth habit, so taking up a lot less room in a garden. So look for it if you're um you know need a smaller cherry yeah and it, and it still has the nice cherry bark i mean it looks yeah you know you wouldn't mistake it for anything other than a, in a cherry except for this perfect columnar habit i like everyone this morning is going to learn the difference between cornus officinalis and cornus moss i see both of these trees uh this time of year uh around the city of raleigh and uh, i'm always confused uh, as to the difference between them they're so striking yeah um, they're real early blooming dogwoods. Mm -hmm. Now they might not look like dogwoods to you because the common flowering dogwood has four big petal-like bracts underneath right. the little yellow flowers. And m most dogwood species, and there are many dogwood species, just have these small, typically yellow flowers. Uh -huh. And the two species that Jim alluded to, Cornus moss and Cornus officinalis, are very, very similar. Uh, Cornus moss is a European species. Cornus officinalis is Asian. Um, and they're almost indistinguishable until they reach maturity, and then you can tell them apart by bark. This is Cornus officinalis, and the bark is very mm. sort of shaggy, whereas Cornus moss, when it's about this age, the bark is very smooth and um, sort of peel, not peely in this way, but like as it sheds bark, it'll be mottled, but still quite small. I mean, smooth. Um, Cornus moss, at least, is known as the Cornelian cherry dogwood. It makes a bright red fruit, much like a maraschino cherry, and they are edible, um, not necessarily super delicious. They're very um, sour. Um, but in colder parts of the world where things like peaches or the common cherries aren't winter hardy. Cornus moss is grown for its fruit and there is some breeding work um, going on to improve the quality of the fruit. But here we grow them as ornamentals, um, especially notable for their very early bloom period. This is actually um, going past its peak because it's already been in bloom for yeah. a couple weeks. Yeah, I was over here a couple weeks ago when it yeah. was in when it was in full flower. These are great ornamental trees. I mean, they they seem like they play they play nice. They're they're uh, unfortunately, you know, not as available as they probably should be. And like you pointed out, and I've pointed out a lot of times on the channel, a lot of these early early flowering things don't end up being purchased because nobody's actually shopping this time of year right. or, or, or 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 looking looking through gardens. Neither one, both of these are non-natives here to the southeast but neither are invasive in any way are they i've never noticed a seedling from yeah, neither them have I. and that's what determines whether or not a plant is going to be invasive if it produces lots of seedlings right especially if birds distribute th uh, those seed you know far and wide right um, well let's find a cornus moss and th then people will know what we're talking about about not being able to tell the difference between okay. them over here in the white garden one of the deciduous magnolias that's almost it just plays a dominant role here in the Arboretum. Um, you want to talk about this one, Doug? Yeah, this is a hybrid. This is Magnolia ex lobneri, Merrill. The cultivar is Merrill, and it's probably 40 feet tall. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it takes the place of uh, something like a red maple or something, but gives you this beautiful floral display early in the year right yeah and the overall shape of the tree is is gorgeous the bark is gorgeous i mean it has a lot going for it other than this one time uh one time one time flowering yeah it really is a handsome thing all winter with its silvery stems yeah right much it, like a beach yeah and it does it does and that and, and that also adds to this white garden 
I mean, even the stems are ha play a role in the white garden. Camellias are trees. Um, you can see these two specimens are, I guess, close to 20 feet tall. Um, they're probably 40 years old or so. Um, the uh, camellia most people know in this area is Camellia japonica, which is also a tree, but much slower growing than many other camellias. This particular one is a fragrant hybrid. I get a little bit of fragrance on this chilly morning, but it's much more fragrant as the temperature warms up later on today. Um, and this was bred by William Ackerman at the National Arboretum. Now, uh, the Ackerman hybrids that most people know are ones that were bred for winter hardiness. Um, but M Mr. Ackerman was breeding fragrance, uh, was breeding uh, for fragrant camellias uh, before the big freeze in the 1980s. And after that big freeze, when nearly all the camellias in the National Arboretum died to the ground, the director told him to uh, drop the fragrance breeding and focus on breeding for winter hardiness. Um, but you can, it's a little bit um, one-sided because we took out a large tree in between these two camellias, but it's starting to fill out. But a nice sort of upright oval shape to this plant. Um, the fragrance is coming from a very tiny white flowered camellia from uh, Japan, Camellia luchuensis, um, that is very fragrant and crossed with um, japonicas, another larger flowered hybrid. You come up with uh, larger flowered fragrant camellias. Now, this camellia over here is also a hybrid, but a very different hybrid. Um, it's a um, this particular camellia is the cultivar Mary Christian, and it's a Williams EI hybrid, um, named for the uh, w Williams family um, who own a, an estate in uh, Cornwall, England. I think maybe it was the Carehays estate, but I might have that information wrong. Um, and they're hybrids between Japonica and another Chinese species, um, Camellia saluensis, named after the Salween River, uh, which starts off in the Tibetan Plateau and runs through uh, Yunnan, China, Yunnan province in China. And they were bred primarily um, for greater tolerance of alkaline soil because parts of England have uh, as they call them, chalky soils, soils that are um, overlying limestone and tend to be uh, alkaline rather than acidic. Um, most camellias want acidic soil. Um, I think people often overdo that. They don't need strongly acidic soil. They just want that, uh, you know, 6.5 range that most acid-loving plants want. Um, but you can see how large the trunks have gotten. Um, it's a really good sized plant, a very sturdy thing. And uh, it blooms for two months or more this time of year. You can see the ground is carpeted with fallen flowers. Um, there's also a uh, variegated sport of Mary Christian. You have the exact same flowers, but the leaves have a bright yellow center to them. And that one has the cult of our name of Golden Spangles. Um, this is always one of the really big um, shows in the Arboretum at this time of the year. So we did track down a few uh, Cornus moss over here. They actually seem to be not quite as open uh, at yeah. this point. Yeah, they're, they're just starting. And uh, you know, unless we had them planted right next to each other, it's hard to know whether right. that one's blooming earlier because of location. But I tend to think that um, what we're seeing is that Cornus moss doesn't start blooming quite as early as Cornus officinalis. Right. Um, right. There's but several. They are very similar. There's several named cultivars in yeah. there. This one's called Elegant, and it is. It's kind of got an upright, narrow um, habit. And yeah. the Others are a bit more sprawling. Yeah. Uh, than this one, but but super just underused. I mean, I, I you know every time I see them in the spring, I'm so, they're, they're so striking, and then I don't see them in any 
you know, ornamental yeah. landscaping. The bark on a mature Cornish moss gets smooth, but you see even at this stage, it's not quite as shaggy as the bark on Cornus officinalis. Um, so that's one way we tell them apart. So there's a beautiful Chinese sassafras here uh, at the entry uh, as you, from the parking lot, uh, walk, walking in, and it's just starting to uh, show some color. You want to talk about Chinese sassafras versus yeah. maybe our native? Yeah. Um, uh, this is one of two species native to China. This is Sassafras Tzumu, T-Z-U-M-U. Um, it, it's a fairly young tree. The trunk is, oh, six, eight inches in diameter. It eventually becomes a big timber tree. And it does not sucker underground like our native one does, Sassafras uh -huh. albidum, which um, forms big colonies. Um, it, it's used in a lot of medicinal ways in China, um, but our native tree also finds some medicinal use. Um, these are just starting to open. They'll become you know, good size heads of yellow flowers. Right. I think also the branching habit of the sassafras is really striking all winter long. And you see on this far side of the tree, the buds are still tight and they look like, right. I don't know, big matchsticks or something. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Little, little globes. Uh, little globes up on top. Does this have the same fall color? Um, I've seen some of our seedlings in the nursery develop superb fall color. Uh -huh. I don't remember if this one does, but you know, I can't judge the species based on this one individual. It does have the typical mitten-like uh, leaves that right. anyone would, who knew our native sassafras would immediately realized this was the sassafras as well. You might not remember the time when the <laughs> co right, continents yeah, right. were all one, yeah, right. but uh, you know, we're, we're, we're told that at one time the continents were all together as one unit. And so, you know, a lot of those species probably evolved prior to the continent splitting right, up and, right. and then became geographically isolated as they separated. And, um, you know, the fact that China has two and there's just one in North America isn't a really good example right. of the difference in diversity. But um, in the last ice age, Asia was not glaciated. So right. the flora of North America and Europe were greatly devastated by the last glaciation, whereas gotcha. um, it, Asia was not. And so, you know, there's other examples like the, our native um, beautyberry. We have one species in North America, one in Mexico, right. mm -hmm. and like 80 in China. Her, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you very much My pleasure. for walking around uh, sure. this morning with some of the early flowering trees. I wanted to cover some of the things that, you know, the magnolias are, are, are fairly common in landscapes, but a lot of the other things were we're talking about and even camellias being trees you yeah. know it might you know that work people are used to you know putting them in little poodle shapes in their uh, yeah. <laughs> in their in their landscape so yeah yeah thanks again doug I ho my pleasure hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. sure and and i might just add that um the, we saw the earliest of the magnolias there's right you know six eight more weeks of spring blooming magnolias to come right yeah, great, yeah, much greater diversity than what we saw today. Yeah, and this this collection, if you get to Raleigh and you get to the Ralston this time of year, this the Magnolia collection is definitely something to see. It's something I go out of my way every year and make several visits during February and March for. So thank you guys for watching. <laughs>